So good morning. This is Dr. Christine Sims from the University of New Mexico uh, here in Albuquerque. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to this webinar, the first of uh, two webinars uh, that we are um, de that we've developed. And this is our first time. This is my first time doing a webinar, but uh, I hope you will um, uh, find the information that we've uh, put together helpful to you all. Um, to start off, we had a chat box. Uh, with a, a uh, question for everybody to think about, and uh, not that there is any one right answer, but certainly uh, a question that um, I think uh, might jog our, our thoughts about how we think about our tribal languages. Um, and so the question in the chat box is, what does a healthy tribal language look like in a community or in a family? And so uh, that can mean different things to different people. Uh, I know from um, the perspectives that I've heard from my own uh, language community is, you know, how we think about our languages is very important. Um, and we often talk about our languages as living entities, that they're not something abstract or, or sitting just in a book, that uh, the, the healthiness of languages is when we hear them spoken, when we hear uh, when we hear children, families, parents, elders using these as communication um, and as a way to engage one another in, in um, good talking relationships, uh, good communication relationships, those are perhaps some things that people think of as um, aspects of a healthy language. So we just put that question out to everyone to think about. And as we go along through this webinar, there will be opportunities for people to um, post uh, their thoughts uh, in the chat room. And hopefully, we will also then be able to address some of the questions you may have as we go along in this webinar. All right? So. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Sims. Um, I'm Joshua Sparrow. Uh, the uh, co-principal investigator for the National Center for Parent Family and Community Engagement for uh, the Office of Ed Start and the Office of Child Care. And I want to welcome everybody who is uh, logging on now to this uh, webinar, which is the first of two webinars on uh, children's native language learning and the role of engaging families and communities in children's native language learning. The next webinar will be um, on May 9th, a week from today. I want to start by thanking all of you for joining and for the work that you do. And I want to thank our presenters who uh, will um, introduce themselves after we review the logistics with you. Uh, we are very fortunate to have a wonderful group of um, uh, experts in this area uh, from a number of communities around the country. Um, as you all know, there are more than 560 federally recognized uh, tribes and many uh, beyond that that aren't. And each one of them has its own uh, culture. And many, many have their own languages. And they're all unique. So um, although we cannot represent all of them in um, this webinar or next week's webinars, uh, we um, have um, some wonderful um, experts from a number of communities who will share their experiences about engaging families and children in, and communities in native language learning, uh, looking at the opportunities and challenges for engaging families and communities in children's native language learning, um, not because um, it could ever be done the same way anywhere else, but um, with the hope that it may spark um, uh, your creativity and um, inspire new ideas or affirm um, the ideas that you're already um, familiar with and working with. Now it is um, my um, privilege to um, ask each of our um, presenters today to introduce themselves. And we'll start with Dr. Christine Sims from the Acoma Pueblo and the University of New Mexico, uh, who uh, kicked us off um, just a few moments ago. And then uh, we'll hear from uh, uh, our other panelists. Uh, good morning again. Uh, uh, my name is Christine Sims, as Dr. Sparrow uh, mentioned. I am from Acoma Pueblo here in uh, New Mexico. 
Uh, I'm an associate professor here in the College of Education at UNM, and um, I also direct the American Indian Language Policy Research and Teacher Training Center. So welcome, everybody. Mike? Miki uh, Amitam Kiho, Mahasusana, Jaki Log, Mike Richardson, Mikila Kiwa. Uh, I want to uh, welcome everybody today. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Uh, I will not be presenting as some of the other panelists are doing, uh, but we will be having discussions uh, about some of those things that are talked about today. Uh, I'm honored that the, the people on this panel I work with on a regular basis, and uh, we, we do presentations and summits across the country uh, on the national American Indian Alaska Native uh, Head of Thought Collaboration Director, uh, and part of that entails uh, language revitalization, and uh, which is something as a priority for Region 11. Uh, but we're hoping those that are not from Region 11 uh, would take this back to your communities. Over 50 percent of our ch tribal children are not under Region 11. Uh, so a lot of this information that we're talking about today for is parent engagement, community engagement, um, can be used in any community. And uh, so we hope you, you get something from this. Language revitalization has become a huge thing. It brings our communities together. Uh, it improves the life of our people. Uh, it connects us to who we are. Uh, it has shown that it is a huge factor in uh, working with special needs children, with children with disabilities, uh, in behavior, in respect to elders and people that are older, and in respect to each other. Uh, so there's a lot of benefits to language. And the people that are on this panel, I feel like, bring a lot to this, and as well as the panel that's coming up the next panel uh, next week. Um, we started out as being one, one uh, webinar, uh, but it was just too much information to have within one, and now it's spread out over two webinars, and really, that's not even enough time for this. Uh, but we're hoping we, some areas can be touched on uh, that will impact everybody that's on this call. I was looking at the general chat, and People from all over the country are, are coming into this. Uh, so we feel like there's things in this can impact everyone, uh, not only just our tribal children, just our children in general, uh, and that the information that comes from it. Dr. Sims is an icon in the language. Uh, always honored to work with her. Uh, and then having Lana there at Hamas and the work that they've done uh, brings a unique perspective to this panel. Uh, and then the thing of developing uh, teachers and adults who can speak the language so that our children can be taught uh, is something that uh, Howard will bring with his discussion uh, today. So we're very honored, uh, and I thank everybody for being on this call. And I thank our panelists again, and Dr. Sparrow, who and the, those that are working with him uh, for putting this together today. Uh, Pila Hook. Thank you, Mike. And now, if we can go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to ask um, uh, Lana uh, Garcia and Howard Payton if you would introduce yourself, please. Good afternoon. My name is Lana Garcia. I'm from the Pueblo of Jemez. I have the privilege and honor of uh, managing the Wallatoa Head Start Language Immersion Program. Um, we are in our fifth year of full language immersion implementation, and I'm just grateful to have this opportunity to share our journey with, with um, everyone that's on this webinar and to just offer um, any assistance that I can provide just from the experience that we've had for the past five years. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Still the god uh Udawa this Dawa do um Chalaki Yak um Chalak the one his um Dagilo Staniho Chalak the one his non and he was Sas Dagilo Staniho. Um hello I'm Howard Payton. I work of the uh Cherokee Nation Master Apprentice Program. Um and it was it's really a pleasure to, to be involved in this. I see a lot of people um that is in general chat, uh, it's good to hear from everybody, uh, and I'm hoping that um, that we capture some of the things that we talked about in preparation of this this webinar. It was uh, 
some of the um, uh, best conversations I believe that uh, a lot of us has, has had, uh, being able to be in touch with other uh, language uh, warriors throughout the um, the United States and their different uh, tribes and their tribal jurisdictions. So uh, it was it was good, and I'm I'm hoping that uh, we can capture that. If so, then I believe that this will be quite a treat. Well done. Thank you, um, Howard. Uh, I um, for those who are just joining us. Uh, I am uh, Joshua Sparrow, co-principal investigator of the National Center for Parent, Family, and Community Engagement for the Office of Ed Start and the Office of Child Care. And this is the first of two webinars on uh, family and community engagement in children's native language learning. And we have uh, the extraordinary privilege of having uh, leaders in this field uh, from uh, a number of communities around the, the country, uh, Dr. Christine Sims, Mike Richardson, Lana Garcia and Howard Payton, who just introduced themselves. And it's just been an enormous gift um, to be able to work together with this group to put together this webinar, next week's webinar for you. And I am just delighted to see uh, how many people are joining us in the general chat and from all over the country. Uh, we have structured this webinar so that we will now move to um, laying uh, the groundwork for Engaging Families and Communities in Children's Native Language Learning uh, with an introduction by Dr. Sims. There then will be uh, time for a discussion, and we will um, uh, try to respond at that time to your questions in the chat box. Uh, we'll then turn to Lana Garcia, who will tell us about her um, uh, work at Jemez Puebla, which has um, been um, a very important uh, model for many. Um, and um, again, we'll have time for questions and comments um, uh, after her presentation of her work in her community. And then uh, we will turn to um, Howard Payton, who will talk about his um, important work in Cherokee Nation and engaging families uh, in uh, the community uh, in children's native language learning. Uh, our learning objectives are to learn about the opportunities and challenges for engaging families and communities in young children's native language learning and development. And as we've said, um, these will have um, uh, uh, enormous variation from one community to another. And that's why another learning objective is to learn from the experiences of a range of native communities while understanding that there are many others that uh, we would love to be able to feature as well. Um, and just aren't able to in the time that two webinars allows us. And finally, to identify strategies for engaging families and communities based on the experiences that our presenters will share with us today. So if we can go to the next slide, please. This is uh, Head Start's program performance standard with regard to uh, tribal language revitalization, uh, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And let's now go to the next. And I will ask uh, Dr. Sims to um, uh, come back in to lead us in this introduction, um, laying the foundations for this work. Thank okay, you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Farrell. So one of the key questions or one of the key issues that we have been discussing um, and, and certainly it's part of the discussion going on in many of our tribal communities is um, the importance of native language learning, especially among young children. And what we wanted to talk about today was why the development of language um, is such an important benefit not only to children but also the families, their parents, um, their their relations and their community, but also the community as a whole. And if we think about native language development among young children, I think it's also from the perspective of thinking, how is it that we expect our children to grow as, as respectful, um, you know, care uh, people who people who uh, children who grow up to be people who are caring, who are respectful and who eventually will be contributing members to our own communities. 
And so that topic of, of child language development is, is so critical, especially when we think about it in terms of also cultural survival. Because as many of us um, know and understand, you know, coming from tribal communities, uh, we know that the two are intricately um, linked, uh, language and, and culture. And so these areas of development for Native children are, are especially important uh, when we consider um, some of the uh, realities, actually, of, of our languages today. So in this next slide, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the stat status of most of our native languages today. Um, and, and again, this might be preaching to the choir, but we know that most all of our languages are, are in some stage of being challenged by more dominant language, um, which surrounds us, which in our case mostly is English. Uh, but the status of native languages being learned by children in, in today's world, we know, is in a very fragile state. Um, I believe even as early as the early 1990s, um, uh, when Michael Krauss did his uh, survey on, on the status of, of language, um, you know, his estimate was that you know, out of something like 175 native languages uh, in the US alone, that there were probably no more than maybe 20, 25 languages in which children were actually learning these languages as their first language, uh, meaning they were learning these at home, um, even before entering formal schooling. Uh, and as many of us um, have come to realize in our own respective communities, <coughs> these variations um, in terms of which generations still use the language, still understand it, and still speak it. Um, that, there's a wide variation of that in all of our communities. And so one of the things I know that um, I, in my work with different language communities here in New Mexico as well as in different parts of the US, um, we know that these efforts to reintroduce native language use has, has become uh, one of the type, top priorities in our communities. And many of our efforts to revitalize and, and re-strengthen our languages as communicative languages um, you know, have depended on and get into the younger generations in our communities. Um, I think most of us you know, um, would, would agree that if, if these languages are to last, then the speakers have to be generated from within our communities. So we see many efforts today, the different kinds. There are community-based efforts. Um, there, they might be school-based efforts. And of course, more and more, we are seeing efforts uh, being targeted at the early childhood level before children enter formal schooling. So the benefits to, to um, children, families, and communities um, uh, is, is wide and broad. Um, it's not just the idea that children uh, learn phrases in the language, but it, it, there's much more to that. And I believe, like I said earlier, that the connection between culture and language is, is one of the key areas. Um, because it is through cultural learning and the language that, that goes with that um, that helps uh, guide <coughs> children's learning and, and their development. Uh, and it also is um, the language that's used is also embedded in, in how we rear our children, uh, how we nurture them, uh, and how we go about teaching them. Uh, and, and those are all benefits that, that come with uh, language teaching being done you know, with, with cultural learning in mind as well. Um, there are other benefits, and, and Dr. Sparrow will probably talk about this uh, later on in, in the webinar. Um, but there are cognitive benefits, meaning children's uh, brain development. We now have good research that, that shows that um, life language learning, um, you know, lights up those synapses in the brain. You know, when when children are learning new things, um, there's also the behavioral, the health, um, healthy and mental. Uh, benefits of children um, learning about who they are, who they identify with in terms of their communities. 
how their social well-being gets developed as children are taught in a language. Um, and, and all of those benefits accrue to children uh, in those early critical years of development before they even start formal schooling. And so this is kind of the crux of what we're going to be talking about today. So one of the things that we know in terms of our languages is that we all come from unique cultural and language backgrounds. And as I said earlier, all of our language communities are at different points. If you can imagine an imaginary line from communities that, that are struggling because maybe there aren't as many fluent speakers left as there once was. Uh, maybe on the other end of uh, this imaginary continuum is perhaps communities that still do have a good number of fluent speakers, especially among the, the adult parent generation. And then somewhere in between, some of our communities are, are at different stages where, where we may have um, different um, uh, age groups who still use the language, but may perhaps we're not finding that in younger age groups. So there's a variety, there's a diversity. But one thing we know is that there are common challenges all of us face in terms of keeping our languages alive. And as well, there are opportunities for children to develop their language learning and, and, and to do this in the years in which they are them most critical time when children develop all of these important skills, that's where we should also be paying close attention to how native language learning and development takes place. Now, from our own cultural backgrounds, we also know that there are diverse perspectives about um, how we think of children, um, not only their, their development, but also how they go about learning things. And so many of the um, most recent kinds of um, research that has been done by, by Native scholars, uh, including uh, folks like Mary Eunice Romero Little from Arizona State University, uh, who, who took a close look at, at the way children, Pueblo children, learn. And a lot of it involves observation. A lot of it involves participation with uh, adults. Uh, uh, a lot of it uh, has to do with um, uh, observing mentors and, and things that happen in and around them. These are all different ways in which you could probably say traditionally many of our communities um, taught young children. And so some of those different perspectives may, uh, may differ in some ways from, from uh, mainstream kinds of um, uh, thinking about what we need to do with children when they're very young. So we shouldn't forget about those cultural foundations in terms of how we uh, look at our children and how they learn and how then we should teach them. There's also diverse cultural and linguistic practices, meaning that all of our communities have very unique features about how we use our languages. Uh, I'll, I'll try to remember to mention some of these later on when we talk about uh, um, different ways that children are um, socialized into our cultural cultural backgrounds. But every culture has these unique cultural ways in which they use language. And children learn that by observing us. And they, they learn those ways that um, speakers use language uh, by having the opportunity to hear that language being used. Uh, in all of our communities, we also know that we have various cultural and language resources. Uh, some of our communities may be fortunate in still having um, uh, fluent speakers and, and uh, cultural, what I would call cultural experts, meaning our own grandmas and grandpas, or <coughs> you know, maybe our aunties and uncles that um, still uh, are very much grounded in, in the language and the culture. Um, but we also know that, again, like I said, in some communities, um, uh, maybe because of just how uh, we are all spread out, perhaps, in some communities. Or maybe we are now finding more and more uh, families in urban settings. So all of these are, are variables in how, how available cultural and language resources are um, to, to our various uh, families. There's also different approaches that are being used in, in different community contexts in terms of language teaching. And so that may um, vary from um, school kinds of efforts where you have um, uh, you know, classes or for children or, or 
in some cases, which you will hear about uh, later, uh, uh, cases where a full immersion school has been developed for children. Um, there might be dedicated times when um, children and uh, families come together to do things in which language is part of the learning that happens. There's all kinds of different ways in which our tribes have tried to begin to address this issue of uh, language teaching for, for young children and for families. I want to talk a little bit here about um, learning tribal languages, because I think some of the things that we often think about in terms of how people learn language are often influenced either by our own experiences in learning a foreign language or, or perhaps our, our only perhaps exposure in terms of learning another language besides our own native as languages has, has been you know, influenced by a lot of what we see being done in school settings. But what we know about the language learning um, process, um, and we know now, and I, I wished that this was that being the case you know, 100 years ago, but we know now, first of all, that learning one or more languages is, is not a detriment to children's development. Uh, in fact, it's enhanced by uh, having the opportunity to learn more than one language. Um, and actually, this is quite normal around the world in which other in which other countries, other cultures, children are learning multiple languages, two, three languages, even before they start formal schooling. Um, and so in our um, history of how, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, in the past, uh, especially uh, through uh, government um, efforts uh, back in the 1800s, uh, the idea of being able to use your native language was something that was not honored or respected. And in fact, the very opposite uh, happened, uh, where um, attempts were made to squash language, uh, native languages. Uh, and so what we know today is that um, language learning can be a benefit to young children. Uh, it is something that happens. Uh, naturally, especially when we think about our own children and how they learned their first language, whatever that was. It might have been English. It might have been the native language. Uh, it might have been both in some cases. But what we do know is that children acquire that not from somebody sitting down and teaching them a lesson. A lot of the acquisition of language happens in natural context. And this is what's important to remember about native languages and when we teach children, how is it that we can provide that kind of setting in which children will be exposed to hearing the language being used? Um, we know that that process of coming together with people who are speakers of the language is very important because they are the models for how language is used um, in, our, um, in our language communities. That sociocultural aspect has to do with the fact that much of um, the way fluent speakers of native languages have, have learned their languages uh, is primarily being in those contexts, different contexts, in where they were able to hear fluent speakers using language for different purposes. They might have heard it for informal means, meaning you know how you greet somebody that you see, you know, in the village or in passing or on the road. Uh, it could be. Uh, how uh, informal in terms of how you uh, greet a group of speakers who are from your community, how you take leave, uh, just common everyday things that take place in the community. Families are also were the primary place um, traditionally where languages would be heard, um, especially if they were multiple generations coming together. Um, those would be some of the social cultural contexts in which language would be learned. Let me also add just one more point here. It also refers to the more formal aspects where children, young people may, might have heard or of being observant of language use in more formal settings like ceremonial use or traditional practices. So what this comes down to is that then children need these opportunities to hear and learn to use language in different ways. Um, and those are some of the principles of how uh, we, we need to remember in terms of how we go about teaching language.
there are many different communities who are doing many different things to ensure that young children are hearing and using these languages. And many of the um, uh, examples that uh, I have observed and also what you will hear today are about how these efforts actually support these concepts, these critical, important concepts of being able to interact uh, with adult speakers, providing opportunities for children to hear and observe that language we knew. And then as they watch, as they listen, as they interact with speakers, they begin to use it themselves. So this is one thing that we have um, uh, seen in, in many of the um, efforts that are being made uh, to, <clears throat> to establish these um, language revitalization efforts in, in ways that make sense and that are appropriate for young children. So one of these uh, guest uh, speakers that we have as part of our panel today is um, uh, Lana Toya who, uh, Garcia, who you um, heard earlier in, in the introduction. And what she's going to do is to share with us some of the experiences with um, the uh, Walatoa Immersion Program that was established in the Jemez Pueblo here in New Mexico. So I'm going to go to the next slide and let uh, uh, Lana, who is the director there of the Head Start in, uh, Language Program, Immersion Program, uh, introduce uh, herself more about her work, but also what's transpired in their um, work on the Toa language. Lena? Good afternoon, everyone. Again, uh, my name is Lana Garcia from the Pueblo of Jemez. Um, Jemez is also known as Walatoa. We call it Walatoa, which means uh, this is the place. Um, it's located about 50 miles northwest of Albuquerque. Uh, we have a tribal population of just under 4,000 people, um, very small, and um, of which 2,500 actually live on Hamas land. Um, Head Start has been in our community since the late 60s, and of course its purpose was to teach our children English, and, um, and sadly that I think a lot of tribal communities who do have Head Start programs and who have had these programs um, for that amount of time since the 60s um, have accomplished this goal. And today, um, our Head Start program um, is very different from when it first started. Um, all the um, conversations around language, um, I think, first started in 1999 when um, a community session was held, um, and it involves children, um, teen, teen, youth, um, adults, um, community members, um, who were asked um, a, the question, what do you envision for Hamas? And um, as far as education goes, um, language and culture was a really uh, big part of uh, the education. Um, and so, um, and then in 2006, a language survey was conducted, and that revealed that 80% of the population was fluent. Um, but when they looked, when they took a closer look at the data, um, um, at the ages of children, um, they saw a decrease in uh, the fluency um, with Head Start age children. And so um, that began the efforts of um, really strengthening um, the language um, in that age group. And so, um, you know, that's been about 14 years you know, since these conversations started and, um, you know, we definitely, you know, 80% is a lot, but we're still not exempt from the influences of English creeping into our communities and, um, and affecting our language. And so today we really see um, a shift in children's language. And, um, when we started, um, I came on the scene in 2007 
and um, you know, it was it was really nice to come across this data and really to to just work with how what we need to do um, as a program to um, strengthen the language in our young children. And what really helped us was um, that the Photo Voice Project, um, we had the opportunity of taking part in this research project with Dr. Eunice Romero. This was in 2008. And the Photo Voice Project really helped us to understand the socialization process um, of our young Hamish children. And um, from the Photo Voice Project, um, we learned about the, um, that there were seven um, cultural learning foundations that children were taught um, from um, parents, from grandparents, from um, family members, and from the community. Because the language, um, as Dr. Stins was saying um, earlier, um, we really feel that our language is alive in it, and it lives in the community. And so um, the seven themes that we that um, were identified that children needed to learn in order to be Hamas were cultural knowledge, gender specific knowledge, values, principles, spiritual beliefs, ceremonial knowledge, and our Hamas language. And all these things, um, the, these seven themes that I mentioned, they're not taught in the classrooms. These, mm -hmm. these things are taught by um, that are taught within the home by, by family members that are surrounding our children and also um, within the context of the community. And so um, what we've really tried to develop in Hamas is an early childhood education that is traditional and authentic and, some, and an education that honors the learning and teaching of Hamas children. And of course, it is community-based. Through this process, um, we've also had to focus on our professional development because, you know, in the beginning, we all did it. Um, when we started, not everyone felt uh, comfortable in, in teaching the language. I mean, and so really, we had to um, focus our professional development um, for our teachers and, and our entire staff because one thing that we've really learned is that this is a teamwork approach. It has to be. You cannot just leave this on the teachers because the children, our children um, in our building, they're, you know, we have our cooks there, our bus drivers, and they interact with the children on a daily basis. So it does not make sense for this to just be a classroom thing. It has to be uh, um, a school-wide thing. And so um, the professional development has always included the entire staff, from cooks, bus drivers, to our coordinators, um, and even to our maintenance crew, which is also, which, which they're not even a part of the education department. They're a part of a, a different department. but. Um, they honor what we're doing, and so um, they make a point as well to to speak uh, the language to to our children. Um, and when we um, first discussed about um, transitioning our program from dual language to full language immersion, there were a lot of um, opportunities where we had to gather our parents. Um, gather our um, traditional leaders, our, our tribal council um, community members through language forums, through um, through parent orientations, through um, through tribal council meetings. Um, we've we've had to um, be transparent. We've had to really, you know, just educate them on the benefits of. Um, our children speaking more than one language, um, bringing those experts to our community and sharing um, their knowledge with our parents, our staff, um, our traditional leaders. You know, that has been one of the key things I think that is critical is, is that you really have to um, bring your families along 
um, with this language immersion program. And what we've really developed is is opportunities where families um, can be involved in our program um, through our parent, our fatherhood and motherhood uh, nights that we have, um, uh, our policy council and, and parent center meetings that we have. We really um, stress, you know, speaking the language, staying in the language, and we also ask families that are um, that have English speaking. Um, family members to bring others to translate. Um, we, I also use a, a PowerPoint and, and try to you know, put everything up there where parents or whoever's there can follow um, the event from start to end. Um, really just, again, to protect our language. And, and um, we also want to make sure that um, no one is feeling left out. Um, Another um, another thing I think that was critical for us is getting the support of our tribal council. Um, tribal council. Um, so back in 2012, um, they passed a resolution for us to become a full language immersion program, and that support from them has been so critical for us because no matter because in for a lot of tribal communities. Um, they have tribal elections every year. And so with this resolution in place, it's really protected the work that we're doing so that no matter who comes into office, um, the work that we're doing um, is protected and it, and it continues. So that's also um, another, um, I think, pretty uh, rare um, Thing for us, that I I don't come across many uh, communities where um, there's a, a resolution of sorts in place to support um, language programs or Head Start programs. So that's really important. Um, so one of the conversations that we've also had um, has to do with once our children graduate, you know, where where are they going to go? How are they going to be supported in other schools? And um, you know, we've been presented with um, um, funding opportunities that have allowed us to have these conversations with uh, our schools that are within our community. Um, children have about three um, choices where they can send their children once they graduate from Head Start. And so it was really um, important for us to uh, get those kindergarten teachers, um, first grade, second grade teachers, um, to include them in our professional development as well. Because like I said, once our children leave um, Head Start with these wonderful language and, and culture um, education, and they move on to, let's say, um, um, to our BIE school or our charter school. You know, we want to make sure that the support continues and that they have, um, that they have the resources um, to continue to support families and children in uh, maintaining their language. And so um, the education department our education department has been really um, has been really just um, hands on about you know providing professional development opportunities for all our um, educators within our community. We meet um, about three times a year. Um, we have um, pro planning days. We have. Um, that our education retreat is coming up in June, where all the teachers. Um, are there, and we and we um, offer language and culture um, um, sessions. I know Dr. Sparrow also provided um, um, some professional development for our teachers as well. So um, the, you know this uh, language immersion um, approach really has. Um, really has to involve your whole community, I think, and and that has been. Um, so helpful for us. Um, it's wonderful when um, last week we, I attended a child abuse prevention conference 
um, that was hosted by the um, social services program. And in the beginning of their program, and, and um, they mentioned that they were going to be speaking in the language and that they would provide, up, you know, also be translating as well. Um, and it was to support um, the, you know, and honor our Hamas language. And I think that, you know, our Head Start program has, has a lot to do with this whole change in attitude um, with our language. And also know that, you know, um, our program has also had impacts on um, the Head Start rules and regulations, the performance standards, which also now um, support tribal programs um, to have to incorporate language and culture um, with whatever the community needs. Um, so currently right now um, with our funding agencies we're working on really um, showing or demonstrating um, our children's progress and, and how to do that in a way that honors and, and um, protects our children and our families because I think when you when you're talking about assessing language, you have to be really careful. Um, you know, we don't. I mean, through, with five, five years of doing this, um, you know, I've had to change the way that we are assessing our language because um, we don't want to um, label children. We don't want to, you know, hurt parents. We don't. I mean, this is. I think this ground that we're on, or that we're working on now with developing um, these assessments um, has to be really uh, thought out and really has to um, include our parents and everyone. Again, you know, we, we, we're working with Dr. Sims right now on really um, the developing those um, assessments. And um, it's there. We see it, um, mm -hmm. you know. Success for us is really seeing um, our children be contributing members of our community, and we see that. You know, our in in Hamas we have a very active um, traditional calendar where lots of opportunities are provided to bring the community together for our dances, our ceremonies, and within those ceremonies, you see our children. Our children are very active and involved and. And these are the things that we want to um, we want to be able to um, share with our funding agencies and and show that you know our children are very um, confident and 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 that and they're proud of who they are and and it comes across in in their singing and their dancing. I mean, we recently just performed for some guests that came to Amos to observe our children and um, we have to develop more um, dance regalia because everybody wants to dance. I mean, um, this is just, you know, it's just a wonderful thing to see um, the children um, learning and, and really just um, being proud of who they are. Oh, well, I, you know, I did mention all of these already. Um, yeah, I really. So, Lena, one of the things that you mentioned, and, and if you would just kind of share with the audience, in the beginning, not everybody was on board, right? I mean, right. even your parents were real, were a little bit hesitant, no? Definitely. When, when you all made the decision to go to transition to a full TOA immersion program. So, do you remember the story you relate to me once about the, the, the mother who was reluctant to about her child being in yes. the program? Yes. So I had a mom who um, dropped off her child to in, um, in the classroom. And she's not a speaker herself. So um, when she dropped off her child and she heard so much language taking place, uh, she came to my office and she said that, um, I think I need to withdraw my child from the class. And I said, why? And she said, because there's too much um, Hamas being spoken. <laughs> she hasn't heard that before, and you know, we don't speak it at home. So I think she's going to be really confused, and you know, I don't think this is the place for her. 
And so I said, um, will you do me a favor? I said, will you please just give it six months? You know, I said, um, I said, what has she said? Has, does she like her teachers? And she said, yes. Um, does she like her classmates? She said, yes. And I said, well, what's the problem then? <laughs> I said, please just give her six months and you'll see. And sure enough, um, right before Christmas break, she called me and she called to thank me for um, encouraging her to keep her daughter there because she said that um, her aunt had been having conversations with their their daughter and that, um, you know, she was just, she just was so grateful that, you know, she heard her daughter speaking and answering um, her aunt's questions and she was just looking at her like this, you know, like this precious jewel that she just couldn't believe that was, you know, able to to speak in the language with her elders and that's, and that's another, you right. know, benefit, benefit mm -hmm. that that mm -hmm. children are now able to speak to their grandparents. And this is only one um, example. There's so many examples now where um, grandparents and uncles are thanking us all every at all our events because their nieces, their grandchildren are speaking to them. Mm -hmm. Well, there's been a real shift, there's a real shift taking place in people's attitudes about, you know, um, children learning and, and actually then using that language outside of the Head Start classroom setting, right? Definitely. Um, and again, just to uh, mention, uh, I, I have visited um, the Wallatoa uh, Head Start Immersion Program uh, multiple times, and every time I go there, it's amazing to see um, how confidently the children are in using this language. Um, and I don't know, I don't recall if, if uh, Lana, you, you mentioned, but Toa is the only language spoken uh, in mm -hmm. by Hamas Pueblo. No other Pueblo tribe speaks that language. So they they really had to address this issue of how are they going to make those changes that will enable a younger generation to have that firm foundation in the language. And so this was Hamas's approach um, to addressing this issue. Um, okay, we're going to go on to the next slide, and, and there's I see questions coming in that hopefully we're going to uh, address here for a couple of minutes. Um, I thank see you. Yes, John. Thank you, Dr. Sims. Um, thank you, um, Lana. Um, such a rich uh, presentation. The chat box has been. Uh, so animated, and there is such expertise um, and um, passion represented in the questions and comments here. Um, one of them was a question about, uh, in an immersion program, how to um, develop proficiency in English as well. And I, there were many other really important questions. I wanted to pull that out because um, that connects with, uh, Lana, what you just told us about um, concerns that parents have, and I think that um, others have heard these concerns elsewhere uh, in other communities from parents. Um, and so I, I wanted to ask um, both of you, and, and Mike, uh, you as well, um, how you work with families, parents, other community members who um, have these kinds of concerns or misunderstandings about uh, how uh, children uh, learn language, as well as the range of feelings that um, uh, individual parents and families and, and community members may have about um, uh, English as well as their um, native languages. So, uh, Mike, are you on on the? Yes, I'm here. Mike? Yes, I'm here. Um, I, I wanted to say, you know, leading into that is that I don't, and I may have missed this line if you said it, but. I don't know if the audience understand that, uh, and I put it in the in the chat box that there is there's no written language for the Toa language, and um, and one of the things that I saw when I was out, your way of teaching, uh, the way your teachers teach, the way your community does things is very different from what we see in in the written language uh, versions of most of our tribe that use a written language, uh, but I I see that as something that impacts the community differently, and it's more a traditional way of teaching. And uh, even within your community, uh, with all the language that's there, 
uh, and I see this throughout the communities that I work in, that uh, in reference to what you know, uh, Dr. Sparrow was, was saying and what came up in the chat box is that really we haven't seen where English is an issue. It's so much of it out there and around them and within their homes and so forth that even if they're within an immersion program, uh, we haven't really seen a negativity of how it's impacting. Now, I know Brooke will cover this a lot more next week uh, with their immersion program. Uh, but if, if either one of you could, you know, speak more to that would be wonderful. So um, thank you, Mike. So one of the things that we know is that um, in, in the case of the Hamas children, they, they already know English. They, they, they have developed English al already. And in most cases, many of our children um, learn e English as, as their first language before when they come to uh, early childhood or Head Start. Um, so the English is there. Uh, but I also have seen in some programs where um, in, in, where they've dedicated times to doing things in English, um, and it might be a very small portion of time, but it's usually something that you know they do. Um, programs have done where they have you know storytelling on Fridays, and it's maybe two hours, and all of that activity takes place in English, but the rest of the time is dedicated to making sure that children get a chance to hear that native language being used and spoken. Now, I also know that in many cases, some of the programs may not have fluent speakers among their teaching staff. That's a, that's a real challenge. Uh, because when in, in I have seen other places where when that situation exists, then it's the adult speaker, adults who become learners of the language and in turn try to use that language as they pick it up with the children. But in that case, you're talking on kind of like a two-way thing here. Um, so there's variations in how people address these issues of, of different language competencies that adults bring. But certainly the question of children learning English, it's true. They are surrounded by English every place they go. Uh, and in more formal years, when they actually enter formal schooling, um, there will be the question of how then they uh, they get supported in terms of transition into the academic English that they need for for formal schooling processes. And that is something that I know Lana and, and the program staff and the community, you know, have been thinking about and discussing and moving ahead towards addressing that issue, um, because once these children uh, transition out of Head Start, then they will go into a regular uh, either public or BIE school. Yeah. Yes. Um, so one of the things that our education department, um, Kevin Shendo, our education director, has really been doing is working with the public education department, the state, New Mexico State Department, um, in 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 just conversations of how we can continue to support our children um, as they transition to the BIE school or or the charter school or even the public education, um, the public um, the public school, um, Hamas Valley, um, because once they go to these schools, um, you know the focus on reading and um, um, literacy is is you know really just shoved down their throats, and where children are reading by December, um, and so what we're really working with them is is um, changing their policies, their language um, around the testing, and and if if if, if um, children are um, if children are Learning their language, then how can they um, how can they um, pass these tests that are all that are in English? And so we're working with how to address these issues. So before uh, we bring um, Howard back into the conversation, I just um, wanted to say two more things. Um, that are my observations of your wonderful work, Lana, and I hope it's okay to say them. I've had the incredible privilege of watching you in action. Um, and the first is, 
With your photo voice um, project, and this is something that other folks in other communities may want to learn more about and, and, and try out, um, you, you got parents and other community members, other family members thinking about this question about language and culture and identity and um, uh, what it means to um, grow up um, to be Hamas in your community. Um, and so you ask them, how, what do they think? And, uh, what is the story that they would tell about that? Um, and, and so I, I think that that helped build the foundation for people to come to you with their questions and concerns about English language proficiency, which is a very common one, and which, as um, Mike says, there, there's no evidence that that is an issue because when children learn the structure of one language well, it prepares their brain to learn others, and it gives them a template mm -hmm. for other languages. Um, yeah. But the other thing um, that I just wanted to mention is in the story you just told us about when you said to this mother who had this concern, just give me six months, um, I think you were honoring her concern. Um, <laughs> you were respecting her concern, right? And And you were... Um, building on the trust that you had already established with her to ask for some more trust. And, and I think that um, that kind of work in the relationship is also really important to making it safe for people to raise what their questions are about is, what's this going to do, is this going to be okay, how's this going to work, and for them to work with you to see where you can go together. Um, so uh, I, I didn't want to put words in your mouth, Lana, but I'm not sure you would have um, said <laughs> said that yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I think that's a very, a very accurate way of, of describing. Um, in fact, you know, Lana has said this took a, a team approach to make it work. You know, so parents have to be engaged in this, and and, and parents are at the front in terms of um, whether they see this as a benefit to their children or not, and. And uh, like we said in the beginning, not everybody was on board. There, there was some reluctance and some, you know, trepidation about whether you want to really do this or not. But I think as you give time for these things to uh, efforts to emerge, um, they they begin to grow. And, and when you have parents engaged in that process, it's even much much better to uh, rather than to try to go it alone with you know one teacher or. Um, it really takes a, a group team effort. I think one thing that's really important is those relationships that, that you're talking about. And we've worked really hard on asking the right questions and, and how to approach families um, when, it, you know, when it involves language and culture because we don't want to offend anybody. You know? And so we have, um, you know, at the beginning of the school year, we take a lot of time to, you know, you know if the goal is to finding out what's the language dominance of the home, you know, how are we going to get those questions? How are we going to get those answers? You know, these are things that we work on um, in our professional development because, you know, that having that relationship with those families is is so critical because we love those kids and we want them. I mean, that's the main thing that we want to always get across is that we love your children <laughs> and they you know they're important to us. Thank you, okay. Lana. So so now we're going to bring um Howard Payton uh, back into the conversation and Howard who introduced himself earlier is program manager for the Cherokee um, Language Master Apprentice Program. And it, um, it, it fits really well with some of the questions that have been raised in the chat box and, and in this discussion about um, how um, one community's approach to um, supporting the development of uh, adult uh, fluent speakers to support the learning of children. So um, you're up, Howard. Well, uh, I'm enjoyed that discussion. I had a I had a hard time not wanting to to jump in, but I know that uh, uh, that I know we're we're lacking sometimes on time. So, um, but uh, the Master Prince program uh, was has been thought about and dreamed about for for several years uh, within uh, some of the citizens of the Cherokee Nation and. Uh, we had an opportunity uh, back in, um, I think it was 
January of 2014 to, to, uh, to do some research and uh, do a presentation to our chief. And at, at that time, he allowed us to um, to go forward. Uh, at first, this half day is to get prepared, and then later, um, when we started getting budgets and that sort of thing, um, you know, to to get some students in. Um, the Master Apprentice Program, uh, we call it a Chalak Dwonihis Aniwisusk, which means um, Cherokee language planters. Um, that's what that means in Cherokee. Uh, we've um, we've um, been involved. Many of the many of the folks that's involved are parents uh, of of children that have been in our immersion school program uh, at the Cherokee Nation. So um, it it came really apparent to us that uh, not only did we want to uh, uh, for our children to speak, we thought it was very important for our uh, young adults to start speaking. One thing we uh, there's an aging population of speakers within the Cherokee Nation. Of course, Cherokee Nation is a large tribe, has about 360,000 citizens. Um, but um, when we started, um, you know, looking at how many uh, people was uh, was now speaking, uh, back in August 2014, we we took a um, approach to uh, a different approach where we called, um, you know, citizens and speakers uh, in in tribal communities and asked them how many speakers was in their community, believing that. Um, a speaker that has been living in a small community would would know exactly who all was, uh, you know, speakers within their community. Um, and I think we got a pretty pretty good uh, number at that point. Uh, there was um, an estimation of about 2,464 speakers. Um, the bottom portion of one of our counties we we really uh, focused on it was a hot spot. That we was focusing on, and we um, did a uh, we you know had these big maps and uh, satellite type photos that we took for speakers to come in and look at you know from bird's eye view which house you know uh, we was looking at and they started identifying where speakers was in that sample um, there was we found 512 uh, speakers and there was um, and we started getting their ages. We found out that the medium age of our speaking population in that particular sample was in between 60 uh, and 69. So uh, you know, we we knew that there was a a, a problem. Uh, so the, the the master apprentice program is a two-year program. And the idea is to not just create a proficient speaker uh, in language, but um, to um, um, to create a, a teacher. Uh, the idea is, that, you know, if there's no need to just teach somebody how to, to speak if, uh, or pro become proficient or, or conversational in language without uh, them having um, the ability to, to teach this particular methodology. Um, so uh, we We've brought them in, and we're and we've actually give them an educational stipend uh, for them to be able to to uh, live there in the process, and they stay for uh, two years, um, eight hours a day, uh, five days a week, and the goal is um, is to try to to stay in Cherokee, and so um, it was really interesting. We we've um, we've graduated two different cohorts now and um, we've uh, we've noticed that, that there has been major major growth in their language skills um, so uh, our language is a very difficult language uh, uh, I think on the on the scale it's, it's uh, a level four uh, they, at the time they rated it they said if there was a level five that they would put Cherokee in it so they're estimated that at that time was uh, 2,880 total immersion contact hours to become conversational 
in, in this language. So um, we tried to focus on uh, 3,900 contact hours. Uh, so the first year, the students learn as much as they possibly can. Uh, and then the second year, they begin um, to, to teach using that methodology. Now that means that you know there's still speakers in the room and there's still teachers in the room, but they're able to elicit um, loop scaffold, um, you know, um, and to keep it in language. Uh, so um, it's um, it's been it's been really successful. Um, so uh, to uh, achieve that that amount of time. Uh, we've we've had to create a lot of things, and, and this hasn't been uh, without challenge because uh, we've uh, one thing our community has uh, been used to having language programs within the Cherokee Nation uh, for uh, a long time, and and we was hitting um, levels that we needed to. So we we wanted to um, to show the the language community. That um, that we, you know, um, that it can be taught because there was a lot of doubt, and that our language was so precious that um, that it's it's something we can't allow to slip through our fingers. Uh, as you see that this this photo here, uh, this is a a mom of one of our participants in the program. Um, but she's a, a native speaker, and um, and that. Uh, and her child is in our program. He's he's a, a little bit older, but he used to be a speaker. And uh, the schools is pretty rough here in Oklahoma, and um, he was allowed to 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 speak in the you know when he started to go into school. And so uh, he was he was kind of uh, holding back around her. He wanted to be able to to show her. When he really thought that he started getting the grasp of language, so he was holding back. But uh, community members was coming and telling her, "I seen your son, and uh, he was he was speaking Cherokee to me." Uh, so this mom shows up out of the blue, and um, and says, "You know, I want to see what my child's doing." And then, you know, this is a big old guy in his 40s, and um, that was a beautiful day to watch. Uh, her baby, um, for her to watch her baby speak uh, our mother language again. Um, so that's um, our our speakers are are you know I think we're we're trying our best to to um, build that uh, faith back into that. Hey, this is this is plausible. Um, so um, so we have a lot of of, of speakers stop by, and we we like to give them gifts, and and uh, and we like to hear their stories, and and uh, if we can, we we cook for them, and and um, and, and this fellowship. Um, as you see, this this picture here, uh, you know, stuff doesn't always come without challenges, and so uh, we we received a little um, bungalow house to be able to start the program in and so we had to knock out walls and and redo things so we we redo floor and, and that sort of thing so we learned how to do that in our language and so we said okay we've got to uh, you know make this work and so um, we had a great opportunity to uh, start using our skills in our language uh, for building terms so um, let me go to the next um, at this point, we're on our our th third cohort, and um, they have uh, they have started going out to a lot of the um, the elder sites. Uh, some of the community buildings uh, have programs where uh, elders are able to come eat, and uh, we've been able to start making friends and and uh, start using that for mentorship. Uh, we've at this point we've uh, graduated six, um, and uh, they they hit 
levels that we didn't believe that we was going to hit. Uh, we built the program believing that we would hit uh, a intermediate mid level on the act standards. And uh, what we uh, found out is that um, we've hit um, advanced low, which was uh, two steps higher than what we believed. So now we're having to kind of change our standards uh, and try to make sure that everybody hits that. Um, and how do we get to the next level after that? So I'm trying to um, go through here, and I'll show you guys some of the standards that we're talking about. Here's the different elders in our community. Our community. And I know we want to have a discussion here in just a little bit about that too. So what is unique, um, I have um, three children myself in the, in the immersion school. And uh, to be able to watch that change in my family, um, my, my babies wake up in the middle of the night and they can't, you know, because they dream in Cherokee at this point. And um, it is, uh, it's always good to uh, have them conversations, my wife, isn't particularly in any program to uh, learn Cherokee, but she is really, really learning quick because my babies, when they wake up, they uh, will remain in Cherokee instead of being in English. So, so here's the proficiency uh, scales uh, that that uh, we thought that we was going to hit an um, intermediate mid level, and so we've hit advanced low, which is as far as we know, is the highest that uh, a program has has helped somebody uh, get to thus far. And we've got a long ways to go, to go because you can see the above that is superior and distinguished. But what is um, unique is that we're already starting to see that uh, our our participants are are going into immersion school uh, to be able to to. Uh, you know, intern and, and that sort of thing. And so it's good to have um, a a younger group that comes in and and relates with them kids. Um, one thing we uh, we discussed in our our discussion earlier, and we're just hitting the very surface of it, is that. Uh, things are, are totally different in the language. Uh, I've been, um, as a, there was a time that my wife and I, we went to um, uh, South America um, to become missionaries and we learned Spanish. And there is, uh, although Spanish is a romantic language, um, it was still a different enough from, from English that uh, there was a different worldview. Uh, Cherokee is so much different that uh, I I couldn't imagine now being uh, I can't imagine not not trying my best to learn it. Um, I've noticed there's a totally different value system that starts to come in when our young people start to to learn that um, they they begin to see the world different. Um, they start uh, hearing different tongues, uh, they uh, uh, they get involved uh, in community, um, they volunteer more because it's so holistic that they're able to, when they start being able to troubleshoot things and look through the lens of a traditional language, uh, it, it's totally different. Uh, like uh, Ethan Pettigrew was saying in the chat box earlier, like, there's a worldview that that uh, we're trying to save that's beyond just the language, and the key to that is absolutely the language. Um, one thing is is interesting that the, the Cherokee language has um, how English would have prefixes, suffixes. Cherokee language has uh, prefixes, suffixes, infixes, and circumfixes. And the common verb conjugates 22,500 times in 
This is a language that is 80% verbs. Um, so the detail of it is, is so massive um, that um, you uh, subconsciously start learning these different rules um, that you can only receive in immersion type processes. And, uh, and you know, there's 72 different pronouns in Cherokee. So um, they, uh, they start looking at things not just, uh, it affects their English even, but uh, they want to be very, very detailed when they're trying to explain something. And I see sometimes that uh, our students start to get frustrated and they just go, they just want to explain it back in, the, in Cherokee. But these are the two different hot spots of the language. We have one down south around lower portion of Ather County, upper portion of uh, Sequoia County. And then we have one in Delaware and uh, Mays County uh, area there. So a large portion of uh, the speakers that we're working with currently is in lower hot spot, but uh, we have some that, uh, that we're hoping to be able to start working with very, very soon in the upper portion because there's um, a little bit different uh, uh, word usage uh, depending on where you're from. Um, I think, looking at the time, we, we don't have a lot of time left. I think we're going to we'll go ahead and open that up for discussion, guys. And I, I know we had a, a lot more to, uh, to speak about. Um, thank you so much, Howard. I, I've been looking at the chat box, and it's just so rich with um, important questions and expertise. And um, one of the comments was about um, how the elders um, uh, might be feeling about the, what you're learning and the progress you're making. And if we think about uh, families and communities from the perspective of different um, Native communities, um, elders are so important. So I, I remember you shared with us one story about uh, uh, how you engage elders and how they have responded. And the other question I had for you was um, if you would be, you talked about how, you know, language is culture and culture is in the language. And um, I was wondering if you'd talk a little bit in the last couple of minutes about um, how um, the, the Cherokee language in the way it um, refers to children actually provides understanding for family and community members about who children are and what they need so that engaging families and communities and children's um, learning and health and development is actually inside the culture which is inside the language. So two separate questions. Well, the, you know, that's the, that's the thing about uh, Cherokee. You know, um, English is comprised of probably, we borrow from 11 different languages. And so, uh, as we was talking uh, earlier, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, you, you can use the word cor uh, courage that comes from the Latin term core that means heart that lets you know that if you really understood Latin while well, you, you know, uh, was, was using that word, you would realize that, hey, there's no way to have courage about heart. Uh, word Cherokee primarily comes from this one language, so every one of them tidbits is already built in that, that word that you're using. And uh, the older the speaker, the the more I think they, they understand that and, and see that from that worldview. Uh, what you're talking about is Dini uh, That's one of our, our words, is one of our uh, words we use for for children, uh, there's actually seven different maturities um, that some elders will tell you. But I was told that um, that particular word has the same root word as to whittle or to carve. Um, how you would um, so the the idea behind that is is uh, at least what elders has told me is that you're not when you look at a child, you're not supposed to look at them as a um, you know, if if you wanted to be a uh, a NFL player, uh, you're not supposed to look at your child and say, "I'm going to make that child an NFL player." That you're supposed to look at them like how somebody that 
is carving out of a piece of wood that uh, if you go and visit somebody that is whittling or, or carving, you say, well, what are you carving? And, and they will tell you, I'm, I'm carving, uh, the wood will tell me what I'm carving, that you're supposed to look at that piece of wood and look and see what maximum potential is for that. So that's the same way you're supposed to look at a child, is to say, okay, what is maximum potential for this child? And uh, if, if you wanted to be a lawyer and you didn't make it, that doesn't mean that you need to make your child out of a lawyer. Your, law, your child may be something totally different because uh, God created him or her um, different than what he's created you. Although you may have similar uh, characteristics, uh, your job is to to open your heart, your mind, and when you're disciplining your kid or, or anything, you have to look at that saying, this child is unique, this child is different. Uh, I, I may do things different with this child than what I would do with the with maybe another child in, this, in the same home because every one of them is so, so unique that, uh, that you have to really clear your heart and open yourself up to, uh, to feel that way. Thank you, Howard. In, in our last couple of minutes, um, I uh, wanted to ask um, Mike and Lana and Dr. Sims to um, uh, comment on um, ideas for families and communities in support of children's native language learning. And to remind everybody um, that we'll be back uh, next week with um, experts from uh, uh, other communities to share their experiences in engaging children and families in their um, uh, children's native language learning. So, um, Mike, Lana, Dr. Sims, uh, Howard, um, final thoughts about um, how to uh, engage families and communities in supporting their children's native language learning. So, one thing we do at, in Hamas is um, we share our lesson plans, um, and we also provide an activity, uh, a monthly activity of a calendar of activities that where the parents um, know what the children are learning and then also so when they get home that will help them to um, um, they'll, that will help them in promoting the language and, and give them something to talk about. Mm -hmm. And for um, a suggestion about language use at home, um, make language uh, something that becomes part of your everyday routines at home. You could choose a specific time, like uh, uh, getting the table ready for eating or when it's time to get ready to go to bed. You know, learn some simple phrases that you can use routinely with your children. And do have fun with the language. Play games with your children. Send them on a scavenger hunt to look for things that you're beginning to teach them in the language. And, you know, um, this is Mike Richardson. I'm you know, I was, I've been blessed to spend so many time with so many different communities, and I spent time with Howard, and uh, I was honored that they invited me to come to their uh, to their program and to sit in the little house they have there, uh, which has a very homey feel into it. Uh, but one of the things that I saw in that, uh, as a community, the things that Howard and them are doing is pretty amazing because not only are they looking at um, the language, but how do they incorporate the different dialects across the community as well. Uh, and I know one of the, some of the things they're doing is they're, they're visiting those different communities there. Uh, and even in my work with Eastern Band, where there is a big cold dialect, there is a, a bird time dialect, there's a snowbird dialect. And I know with uh, Cherokee Nation, there's even more so. So um, the fact that they spend time with those elders and first speakers in those different communities uh, enhances, I think, the overall tribal community as a whole because it brings everybody together. And one of the big things that we see out there is you got to have really thick skin when you learn the language, especially tribal languages, because right. everybody would be correcting you. <clears throat> and if the dialect's a little bit different, and we've even seen different dialects between different families within the same language group. Um, so, you know, we tell people nobody is wrong. It's just a matter of understanding how somebody else is approaching it or what they're saying. There's always that respect there that's given. Uh, but the work that Howland is doing there is really amazing. I do believe it's bringing a lot of the communities together. 
Uh, you know, we're working together now to try to get it more into the Head Start program there, uh, along with Sandra Turner. I know she's on the <laughs> she's on the call as well. Um, so I, I'm just honored to know these people, to learn from them. Uh, the stuff that Dr. Sims and Lana is doing, and the guests will be coming on next week as well. Uh, it's just really amazing. And um, if you could have heard just the dialogue that went between the panel, just talking among each other, there was so much to be, that could be gained from that, uh, just talking about the different experiences, the different areas. And this is about the community. This is about parent engagement. When the children are, are involved, uh, the parents are a big part of that. And sharing that with the parents and getting them involved enhances the overall community and gives that child more of a status. And boys, learning the language that is going to impact them outside the English environment, we haven't seen where that impacts them. Uh, it enhances them in every aspect of their life. It's just all in your approach and what you use for that. You know, Mike, I, what we found out is that, um, you know, I've seen so many comments about boarding schools and some of the stuff that many of our our speakers has went through has just been, uh, if, I, if I could just, there's no way to even express the stories that I've heard that the abuse that has happened because they spoke their language. And, um, but w when we started, the, when we made a decision that, hey, this, this particular program is going to show indifference, um, I remember there was a time that there was a, we were going to show indifference to speakers, and there was a time that a tornado came through our area. And so our crew got together and we said, we're going to try to go to every speaker's house that we can uh, to in that area and help clean up. Uh, so we, you know, we got chainsaws. We, 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 uh, we grabbed uh, some bologna and some bread, and and, and there we go. And uh, to sit there and and, uh, and spend time with them elders and to work beside them at their house uh, using our, our our language. Uh, it's it's hard to, to think of anything less rich. So. Thank you so much, Howard, Mike, uh, Lana, Dr. Sims. Thank you all for joining us for your important questions and comments and for the work that you all do. This has been such an honor to uh, learn from all of you. And uh, we look forward to seeing all of you and your friends a week from now when we um, come back together again with um, uh, folks working on uh, children's native language learning, engaging families and communities and that work in uh, a number of other communities. Thank you all. Thank you.